I'll say, I'll say the excitement uh, of makerspaces in education is that they present new kinds of learning environments that allow lots of different ways of knowing things, lots of different ways of expressing your understandings, lots of ways of under exploring what you don't know in your own questions to be contained within environments that have lots of resources to help you figure out whatever it is you want to figure out. I think a lot of the questions have to do in terms of how to design the space itself and what kinds of tools should or shouldn't go in there and what kinds of things are needed, but also a lot of policy issues and how do you run the space and social aspects of creating a space. Mm -hmm. So I think it's both, it's you know the social plus the engineering design. When you think about makerspaces you need to think about both together. For the makerspace research the big question I'm, I'm interested in is you know, how do we design a makerspace that's developmentally appropriate for young kids and that introduces ideas from the complex world around them, which is the world of technology, but incorporating play and incorporating all the old traditional materials like Play-Doh and Storyform, everything. So that's really the big question. So we have a number of different makerspace related projects. So Brian Gravel is heading up the one that's with the International School of Building, looking at how can you take a school that is very much designed around the concept of learning through play and put a makerspace in there where some of that play might be these tangibles that get people to learn something about electricity, learn something about um, heat and cooling of materials, material properties, all that sort of engineering uh, knowledge. We have a project one of my doctoral students is working on looking at how the space itself promotes creativity. So first of all, all defining what it what we want to measure in, as creativity, what are we defining as creativity, and then how do we actually measure it, and how can we leverage some modern technologies uh, to help people be more creative. So one of the big things is getting just-in-time help. So can the computer actually assist you in getting that help by telling you there's somebody else in the room that might have the knowledge that you need? The key ingredient to making is the same as the key ingredient to, to learning. You don't always know where it's going to take you, but you're really invested in it, and you feel empowered to at least explore what, what could get you there. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of learning through your hands and actually making things is, you know, from the beginning of time, there's nothing new about that. The place that it always had a lot of strengths was in the younger grades, so the kindergarten and preschool kids were allowed to actually try things out and make mistakes and argue with each other, which are sort of the attributes that I really like from the makerspace. So I think a lot of the stuff that we can prototype with the younger kids works just as well with the older kids, and so can we, can we understand how the younger kids are learning in this mechanism, because they're very good at it, that's how you start to learn, uh, and can we leverage some of that knowledge to improve it for kids in middle school, high school, and college. I think that many of the same phenomena that you see in a university setting or in an older classroom are present in an early childhood classroom, but simplified. The Montessori classroom, in spite of many virtues, is, is often criticized for having a Victorian mindset in which there's one right outcome and many of the apparatuses in the Montessori classroom um, can be sort of solved or put together in only one way. And although, although a child is free to choose one apparatus or another to work on at any given time, and in this way the child has a self-directed experience, once the child chooses this one piece of equipment to work with, it can only be sort of solved in one way. To me, a provocation um, has to have three things, and not three materials, but like it has to hit three kind of points for me. And one is that it has to be visually attractive and inviting, not just to children, but to adults too that come into the room. And I want people to come in and want to get their hands on the materials and want to explore and want to play. and see things more clearly and just kind of 
navigate the space in their own way. Um, I also, it's important for me since I have a wide range of ages and abilities that the provocations can be challenging for different, different age groups. And then it has to be open-ended. So Amanda Strohacker right now is, uh, is in Denmark and she brought kibos into the school and the, the kibos are going to stay at the school. And what she's doing is develop, uh, testing one of our curriculum units that we work all over the world with it, which is called Dances Around the World, where children uh, learn how to become engineers and designers and create robots that can dance and can move according to a particular music around the world. The thing that a lot of people don't remember about programming languages is that they are a language. And just as with any other language, there's a syntax and there is a way you can communicate. And the, these blocks were, and the, the robot behind it, were conceived as a way to introduce children to the idea that you can control what this technology does. And the way you control it is with this line of code and the most important thing about the line of code is the sequence those core ideas that you can control what happens on that screen or on that robot there is a the way you control it is with a language and the language has a sequence are the three guiding principles of the technologies that we make because in all of our research we've found that those are the core concepts that they're foundational to later development of understanding of these technologies and they're also the ones that kids need help with the most Yes, I think they're learning, they're learning to make things all the time. It could be with Legos, it could be with paper, um, with fi fibers. Uh, and and, that, and we'd, think of, we'd like to think about this big idea of, of technology. So technology um, and inventions solve problems and they may cause problems, often they do. Tell me. So we're looking at how do high school students perceive or view a, a maker space in their school. And that's a little bit of an unusual combination, having a maker space within a high school. So we interviewed the students after they took a semester long digital making elective course and asked what they noticed about the class. So it particularly stood out to me that several students mentioned that they felt comfortable with their teachers, they felt comfortable asking them questions, they felt that their questions were answered in ways that were helpful to them. So I did one last year which could drive by itself and I just wanted to replicate it and make something better than the one that I did last year. Alright, so I built this so it can basically drive itself. Um, right now it's not complete yet, but when it's complete, um, I'm going to add sensors in front and in the back so it can drive by itself. And currently I'm in this state of doing which um, I'm building the shifter and the shifter will allow it to switch gear. So it works like that and it will slide um, to that shaft and that way it can select a gear that is, that's the highest gear which that's the highest gear which will turn this and turn the draft train which is allowed to move and that right there is the lowest gear. So right now in that seat has a lot of talk but it will go a lot slower. It's funny when you watch him, if you watch the evolution of his work, um, it's often that he'll make um, He'll make either a new diff open differential or a new drivetrain. Um, he'll play with that, and then he scales it up. So I remember the first time I met him, he had had a few robots that had treads, um, and they were all maybe three, two, two feet long, foot and a half. Um, and then a few weeks later, he was working on a 16-wheel, uh, almost three-foot-long robot using the same mechanism that he had had on the shorter ones, but 10 times over. 
My interest in educational makerspaces and the research that we're doing within those makerspaces follows along very closely to my research in terms of educational technologies in general. When thinking about educational makerspaces, I like to think of it from three different angles that really highlights the type of work that students are doing in there. First is this idea of creativity. How do we enable students to make and create what it is that they want to do? Putting the power back into the individual students to be creative and innovative and across the whole classroom making sure there's a diversity of solutions uh, amongst all of the students. The second piece that I'm very interested in researching within these makerspaces is the idea of documentation. How do we actually capture the work that the students are doing so that uh, from a teacher's point of view we have uh, artifacts with which we can evaluate the students. From the individual students perspective it allows them to reflect back on the work that they were actually doing but then it also allows them to share their work outside of um, the individual to other students within their class, other students within their school or across makerspaces with other students uh, around the world. The third area that I'm very interested in thinking about when we're thinking about educational makerspaces is this idea of collaboration. If suddenly I'm sharing my work with you and you're sharing your work with me, how can we benefit from that? How can I start to learn from what you're doing and you learn from what I'm doing? And thinking about how we have students within educational makerspaces that have different areas of expertise, as one student becomes more proficient with a particular tool, how do we start to work the classroom system where uh, different students can help each other through the design implementation uh, process as they start to create, as they start to make. So I'm very interested in thinking about how we can leverage the documentation, how we can leverage the skill sets, how can we can leverage the social network that exists within the classroom, within the makerspace, to increase collaboration and enhance the sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning experiences. So it's not so much just a teacher having to lead all of the educational experiences, but we start to see the students leading their own educational experiences as a collective. The reason I'm working on maker spaces or making it all is because of my interest in supporting elementary teachers in doing engineering design with their students. And specifically, I want to support urban elementary teachers, so those who are planning to or working in under-resourced um, sort of high-need schools in cities um, and urban teachers who are new to the profession of teaching. This is because I think it's a really interesting group of people to work with. They're still forming their identities as teachers, their identities as practitioners of different disciplines. So I think there's just a lot of interesting responses and ways they can engage with engineering design. If they're going to do engineering design, um, the question is what kind of engineering design and what problems might they solve? And we're trying an approach um, where the teachers and their students together identify problems in their local community, which could just be their classroom, but could be their school or their neighborhood or their city. Identify problems that might be solved with an engineering design approach. Um, and we help teachers see what those kinds of problems are, how they might relate to important kinds of scientific reasoning that they want their kids to be doing, um, and then think about how to scaffold their kids problem solving. Um, a portable maker studio is a set of sort of the bare minimum kinds of materials and tools an elementary teacher and his or her students might need to start to prototype solutions to community problems. And so we're looking at ways to um, sort of outfit a set of modules with the right stuff in a way that's really easy for a teacher to transport to her classroom and then unpack so that kids can keep their things organized, can know what sorts of things they have access to for their problem solving. Because the problem solving is so in such a relationship with the kind of materials and tools the kids have. Um, and then pack back up when they're done. I'm an occupational therapist and a recent graduate of Tufts with a lot of enthusiasm for assistive technology and making things. And so I have um, been brought on board to help bridge the OT and engineering departments and to establish resources for students to use in creating new technologies. Here at Tufts, the fact that our OTs and our engineers are now co-located in this same building for the first time, we are poised to collaborate. So the OTs understand the client's needs well and the engineers have all this fabrication knowledge and so my goal has been to 
build the relationship between these departments so that we can be applying our knowledge and creating more innovative solutions. I ran a maker internship with undergrads at Tufts and we had seven undergrads who came in for two weeks and worked all day from nine to five on developing project ideas and inspirations for 10th uh, grade science teachers in um, physics, chemistry, biology, and math. Um, and they came up with project ideas that touched very specifically on points of the high school curriculum. Um, so Novel Engineering started um, with an NSF grant and what it is is using classroom literature that teachers are already using and working with them um, so that they can work with their kids to find problems in the books and then the kids solve problems for the characters. So the characters become their clients and then they engineer something to help the book, get the, get the characters in the book. We did the most dangerous game in sixth and seventh grade cl mixed classroom and that was really successful. It's a short story, but the kids were still able to get enough information from the text to inform their designs. Um, and one of the things they made was a pair of shoes that could be used to walk on quicksand, and to test it, they went out in the mud to sh and just sort of assumed if they could stay on top of the mud, it would probably you know, function the same as quicksand, and that would work. I think you can do a lot of tinkering to come up with an idea that you may then need engineering to finish, or you may be doing some engineering and be at a place where tinkering allows you to see what possibilities you could go um, into next. But I, I do see them as sort of different kinds of activity, um, motivated by different goals, different uh, intentions. And I think making presents a really interesting opportunity where they can be um, cooperative. We're really interest in, interested in culturally contextualized making. So on the Navajo Nation, um, they have traditionally done making for a long time. You know, they have uh, weaving and pottery and silver smithing. So all these traditional Navajo activities, which we would definitely consider to be forms of making. Um, so it's trying to, essentially the project proposes that we look at how the Navajo are already doing making and how it's already a part of their traditional culture. Uh, see how that fits in with their educational philosophy. So the documentation tools that are being developed by Susan and others at the um, CEO I think are also very exciting. Uh, I knew early on, even as a sophomore in college, that documenting my work would be very important. It, their project is fundamentally about reducing the amount of friction involved in recording and documenting your work. If they can get that down to a point where it's almost automatic and almost becomes fun to do so and annotate and narrate your making process, that's going to be huge for tough students when they actually start applying for jobs and trying to get a portfolio together to show their potential employers. Um, How do we better capture what's going on in the minds of kids, especially when you have a classroom of, say, 30 or so, and you can't be monitoring and seeing all the different projects going on? So it's kind of a documentation is a bit twofold where it benefits us as either the researcher or the teacher to know where the kids are struggling if they're documenting the process. Um, rather than just seeing their final outcome. But it also helps the student engage in the practice of documentation as an engineer. Engineers, good engineers, documentation does benefit their whole process. Whether it's through ref like reflecting, portfolios are really valuable in all sorts of disciplines, not just engineering. Um, but also learning from your mistakes and just really taking ownership and pride over what you're doing. So Brian O'Connell has developed this RFID system so you can tag in, tag out of the Maker Studio. Also, you can indicate which tools you're using and also he can provide an interlock so that you are not allowed to use a certain tool until you've passed certain certification. And I think the power in that is to really track user usage. I think uh, in Makerspaces we're always asking who are our users, when are they coming? What are they using? What are they interested in? Over the past couple years, I've been examining um, creativity as a concept. Uh, one of the things most places, uh, most people associate with makerspaces um, is the creativity that comes from them. And um, that 
can be tied a little bit to their interdisciplinary nature, uh, their openness, and the fact that they're kind of community environments. They provide a social network and um, a culture of allowing you to try ideas and build up those ideas. But then I think about mathematicians who are tinkering with proofs. That's what they do. They, they say, can I apply this, 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 uh, this rule to move forward in my proof? People have been making for ages, and it sometimes gets defined, a movement gets defined by the loudest population. And the maker movement has really been a very white male privileged movement. And so they don't always count things like textiles, non-electronic textiles, as making. But I feel like making spans making decorative arts, like home, home kind of arts, cooking, like, like chemistry, homebrew, like coffee making, like all, they're, they're, these can be turned into really scientific things. A lot of people want to put a makerspace in their school, want to have a makerspace in their community, and the first question is, how much does it cost? And that's the wrong question, <laughs> right? It's, you need to know why, why do I want this? What's the goal? Who's this for? Um, and I think people believe you drop off a 3D printer and uh, suddenly you have a world full of makers. That's not how it works. Do maker spaces make makers? That's the question I'm gonna chase for the next year or two or whatever. I think ultimately our job is to be, to help children leave with strong identities, strong skills and strong identities and self-respect who can impact the world in positive ways. Education is not working as we see it. Education in traditional classrooms is not working. So we need to look at other places. And informal learning environments have always been of interest. And makerspaces are another way of thinking about an informal learning environment. And I do believe that in a world where we are going away from computers into smart objects, things that think, mm -hmm. it's a natural place to be thinking about where can you make those things think? And those are makerspaces. But it's a long tradition that continues informal learning.